All right, hi everybody. Welcome to a Lake One virtual panel. Today we're gonna to be talking about event marketing in the era of COVID-19. Uh, so we reached out to some really smart event marketing folks here in the Twin Cities um, to talk about the challenges associated with meeting face-to-face uh, -face when events are canceled, uh, but in-person connections are still a really big driver to B2B organizations uh, and consumer brands that are looking to create brand experiences. Uh, so we're hoping to have a really awesome conversation here today to talk about the impact that COVID-19 has had, uh, what these folks are seeing uh, play out in their organizations um, and what they're planning for for the future because there's going to be a future uh, after COVID-19. So what we're going to do here is uh, let each of these fine folks introduce themselves and get right into the conversation. So first up, uh, Jenna Johnson, give us uh, kind of your background um, and also, um, you know, when COVID-19 hit, um, what was your initial reaction uh, as the trickle down started to happen, events started to getting, getting canceled? Um, you know, how did, how did you immediately react and respond in your introduction? And for each of you, the same question. So Jenna, you're up. Awesome, yeah, I'm Jenna Johnson. I work at Dominion Property Management and Development Company for apartment housing. And we specialize in affordable housing actually. So we are located in 21 states and we have over 230 properties that we manage, um, roughly 50,000 uh, residents. And so um, I am now the communications marketing manager for about the last year, but previously I was the corporate events coordinator. And I did that for about three years. And um, my role with that was posting all of our groundbreakings, our grand openings, our holiday party, our leadership conference. Um, last year alone, we did 60 events. And so, um, and we even did from um, our own internal corporate uh, happy hours, uh, employee engagement events and activities. Uh, so kind of a broad spectrum on events in our company, um, but all of our events are internal. Um, and then we'll connect with external stakeholders and investors, city officials, um, governors, mayors, things like that when we do our groundbreaking and grand opening events. My first initial reaction, and I can maybe get into this a little bit more later um, if the, the question asks it further, uh, but my initial reaction, I was down in Vegas actually at a, a special event conference. Um, with 50 or was it five over 5,000 people I think it was when everything started hitting and everything started shutting down speakers stopped showing up um, and but the conference was still going on so my initial reaction um, each day it got a little bit more real um, and then we ended up I was down there with our, our now corporate events coordinator and we decided to make the trip back a day early just because we weren't sure what was going to happen with airlines and flights and if things were going to be canceled in that area and if we were going to have to make the drive back. So um, initial reaction was a little bit of panic, I think, with everybody and just the fear of the unknown. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jenna. Rich, you're up. Good afternoon. I'm Rich Rizzardi and the Vice President of Client Engagement uh, with STAR. Uh, STAR is an ex experiential marketing agency. Uh, we're a custom designer, fabricator. Uh, we do installation uh, and we're here in Minneapolis. Um, our business uh, requires large gatherings of people. Uh, so this is a rather interesting uh, time for us. Uh, there's um, our business, you know, we're heavily involved in trade shows. Uh, we're doing retail environment, uh, we're designing for corporate interiors, and then we do a lot of sports and event activation. Um, so you can imagine some of the challenges uh, that we're facing. Uh, my first reaction on all of this, um, and it starts with the fact that I started at STAR on March 16th, um, coming in to help to, um, drive vision um, and strategy as we move the business um, forward you know what were our growth plans so uh, imagine being responsible for all things uh, strategy uh, sales marketing and client experience and then suddenly where would all the people go um, so our reaction was quickly is is how do we start thinking about the impact of uh, the pandemic not really 
having a sense, is this a two week, is this a two month? What's the path of it? And it really has challenged us to think about the role of brands, um, the role that brands play in engaging with um, consumers. Um, surprisingly, consumers want to hear from brands. Uh, so as we've been working through this, um, a lot of what we are discussing and the work that we are doing is around how do we create comfort, right? There's so much going on right now around safety and security. And people are going to come back. We're humans. We want experiences. We want to be connected. So we're uh, spending a lot of time talking with clients um, about future needs. Uh, we do have um, projects going on, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit. But it's really about how do we create experiences that allow people to um, have empathy as they um, integrate back into society. It's hard to believe that we're saying people are in society. Um, but having brands meet um, consumers and on their terms and really having a voice of trust, authenticity, um, and really de demonstrating connections. And I believe brands are going to play a big part of that. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for joining us. Um, Jackie, you are up next. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Evans. I am with Type A Events. We are a third party event planning agency based in Minnetonka. We have several local clients, um, but a lot of our business is done specifically with clients across the United States and um, internationally. So we, um, we definitely focus on large scale user conferences, um, anywhere from 200 people up to 40,000 people. So we run the gamut of everything event planning. We also um, have several clients that we do events for in terms of incentive trips, sales kickoffs. So with that business portfolio, certainly with everything going on with COVID-19, it was definitely quite a shift in our business model. I mean, certainly some of those events we've been able to transfer over to, um, I know everyone uses the word pivot, but we pivoted those over to virtual, but certainly some of them of those more high touch VIP events, incentive trips and things like that. Um, it's definitely been a challenge on rebooking or moving those to different times. So um, initially when the news hit, I was in Australia doing event with our team. And once we got off the plane, we really realized how much of a massive effect this was going to be. Um, you know, that event was in February when things were kind of starting to trickle down to other areas. So certainly we had enhanced sanitation guidelines and things at that event, but really it hadn't fully hit the events industry, I would say kind of in the US till probably a couple of weeks later. So um, again, it's, it's been interesting in terms of our business. We've been able to successfully pivot a lot of our events to virtual, but with that, of course, um, comes managing the expectations of how do you take, you know, a face-to-face -face exciting brand experience. Like Rich mentioned, people are, are hungry for those opportunities and how do you still make it fruitful and meet the ROI of your clients. So it's, um, it's definitely been an exciting, challenging time that's uh, made everyone, you know, be even more nimble and creative than we already are as event planners and marketers. Awesome, thanks Jackie. Christina. Yeah, so Christina, um, I'm the field marketing manager at Field Nation. Uh, field Nation is a B2B software company here in Minneapolis. Um, and so I've worked there for just a little over three years. Um, and I'm responsible for our trade show and regional strategy. So I work really closely with our sales and product teams um, to execute marketing campaigns um, that generate awareness for Field Nation and then also, you know, bring in new customers. Um, and, and more recently, since this crisis, I'm also you know, transitioning a lot of our event efforts to virtual events. Um, so managing, you know, everything that we're doing as far as virtual events go and webinars, which, which is a new, a new thing for us. Um, traditionally in the event space, we do attend more larger corporate trade shows. So kind of when, similar to Jenna, when this all happened, I was actually um, about to fly out to Las Vegas um, and two days before an event, we had a large, very large trade show in Vegas canceled. So Ever since then, it's it's been a lot of triage, triage at first. I feel like in that initial um, panic, kind of that she mentioned as well, just just based on the fact, um, you know, the spring is a very popular time for for trade show season, as everyone knows. So, um, you know, that was a lot of moving parts. Just making sure we, you know, figured out which ones are canceled, what's being postponed, kind of similar to what everyone probably experienced during that time. Um, and similar to you know Jackie, we've we've really been taking this time to figure out, you know 
what is moving to virtual events look like for us? You know, we can't just transition every event to virtual. So really figuring out, you know, what our strategy is there um, as we go into the rest of the year. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. And last but not least, Stephanie. Hi there, I'm Steph Lindo with Heroic Productions. We are an event production company, um, or AV production company here in Minneapolis. Um, and my role, I am the manager of Next Generation Business Development, um, which is helping support our sales team and then also overseeing and executing all of our marketing and communications um, strategy. So, my first initial thought through all of this, I don't, I'm surprised none of you said this. I was so scared. I'm still a little scared. <laughs> um, but it was a really, you know, when this first hit, and especially for the events industry, we within 48 hours lost, I mean, like ca canceled, rescheduled, postponed events, quarter one, quarter two, it was all out the door and it, that was really frightening for our team and for the industry as a whole um but immediately after i went through my scared phase uh i have a pr and communications background and um had to flip into that mode and crisis communication is something that comes with it so um my official my initial thought was we need to figure out what our messaging is obviously av has again like everyone else taking a pivot in terms of need um and we certainly have services that such as video and live streaming that we just hadn't been advertising as much as some of our other core um capabilities like our lighting and sound for big large-scale conferences and meetings and trade shows so yeah that is that was my first thought through all of this awesome well, I want to thank all of you so much for being a part of this um, and appreciate the candor right away out of the gate. Um, everybody kind of kicked off with touching on a similar topic and used various flavors of the same word, pivot and virtual. Um, so Steph, I want to pick up with um, kind of the pivot that you started to talk about um, and the flip into crisis mode. So this is going to be a question for the event companies um, on the on the call here today um, is if, you, if you're um, comfortable sharing what you can, what, what did that pivot look like um, on the production side of the event table? Um, how did your organization start to pivot and adjust to client needs knowing that, okay, we're pushing out in-person events. Um, we don't know how long we're pushing those out for. We still really don't know how long we're pushing that out for. Um, I'd love to kind of know what that looked like um, for the three of you. Um, and let's start with Stephanie if you want to respond, um, and then we'll go to, to Jackie and Rich as well. Yeah, of course. So um, as I mentioned, live streaming and video have been core capabilities of Heroic, and that was something that we knew would be a pretty big need. Um, so we were fortunate enough to have a massive 8,000 square foot warehouse uh, with it in the back of our office that wasn't being used. And that was a dream of our, our owner and founder to one day use that space for something in the events industry. Um, and our team was able to turn it around within a couple days into a broadcast studio. So it's this massive three set, three camera, all the equipment in the world. Um, to put on a, a virtual event or to do uh, pre-recording content. So um, immediately after we were able to get that up, we changed our messaging um, to say that this is something that we can support you with. And while doing it in a safe and controlled um, environment, I think that's a big thing that we really wanted to push. There are other companies out there that, that might be doing the same thing, but the space is just so big that it allows us to really hone in on the fact that it's you're not up close to people when you're when you're doing your broadcast so that was our big pivot that we made right away jackie yeah thank you um you know similar to that i think as stephanie mentioned once we kind of got over the initial shock of all right we have to be even more nimble now and be even more creative than we are as event people um we really sat down with each of our clients and, you know, looked at, you know, you have, for example, an 8,000 person event, you have several activations, you have some very, you know, intensive things that are important to you, but now that we're going visual or virtual, we kind of sat down and redid that SWOT analysis of, you know, 
you have all these sessions, you know, we were planning to do, the, to do them live. Let's call up the partners that we trust. And again, that was one of the first things we did once we analyzed what was important to our clients that could easily transition over to virtual was reach out to our network. Because of course, as we all know in our inboxes, there's all these new companies popping up with the latest and greatest live streaming and virtual mm -hmm. platforms. And they're kind of a dime a dozen. And it was really important for us, once we heard from our clients, what was gonna be important to transition them to virtual, to really plug and play with, you know, who are the AV companies we wanna bring in? What's the virtual platform that we're gonna really closely align with to um, really be that, those, um, to really have that need for our clients. And again, you know, as event people, our clients are always looking to us for that recommendation. So it was really important for us to take a step back once we heard what our clients need needed and then find who are those partners that are true and trusted to really help us successfully pivot during this, um, you know, time that feels a little bit like a gray area. And for event planners, we don't love that gray area. We'd rather have it be very black and white. So we really had to align ourselves with who was going to best meet the needs of what we needed as an agency and also for our clients. Let's be honest, Jackie, I don't think anybody, whether it's event planning or marketing, no. I don't think any of us are operating very well in the gray area. We're all no. making it. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a little Rich, hard. <laughs> Rich, one thing that you had said early on that um, in your intro that I wrote down and I really thought was, um, the, the words were very specific, um, and I'm curious if you can expand on it, um, how you guys are doing this around the virtual piece of creating comfort and driving empathy. Sure. Um, around brand experiences because I think uh, one uh, people are craving those authentic experiences now more than anything and it's so mm -hmm. hard like it's so hard to have you know an empathetic experience this way so I'm just curious you know how how have you guys been thinking about that at Star because I love that you chose those words specifically yeah and then there's other choices of words that I never thought I'd be using so <laughs> often pivoting and social distancing um, I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe not having to use them as much. Uh, but Jackie, I appreciate your comments about dime a dozen. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing how much technology is out there. Um, and there's a lot of good technology out there. I think as we looked at it, and we've been in that space, uh, was really demonstrating to our clients, you know, we know your brand, right? We know the experience that you're trying to create. So allow us to help you navigate those technologies um, and to continue to demonstrate what is that brand experience and then how do we bring it uh, together virtually. Whether it's hosting a meeting like this, uh, we've done 3D trade shows, um, and we have more work in that area. The, the, the notion of integration, empathy, and creating comfort, I think for us goes even much deeper than virtual. Um, we build physical environments. We are designers. We're creating experiences beyond just um, a show. Uh, we're helping to drive the conversation. We're helping to drive how people feel. Um, how many people have gone out to a grocery store and have seen more plexiglass screwed into counters? What's that feeling? What's that emotion? Um, that's created there. So the conversations that we're having, remember I have a, a team of folks with a client today um, who's not open but will be open. Uh, how do we integrate design so when people come back, it feels like the brand and it doesn't feel uh, sterile. Uh, so when we talk about comfort, uh, when we talk about that element of integration, it's the role of design uh, to bring that uh, feeling across. Um, and as we all transition through this, you know, whatever the new normal looks like, um, it's going to be important um, in how we you know, really bring people and communities uh, back together. Awesome. Thanks, Rich. I'm going to turn to uh, the two marketers on the panel here, too. Well, everybody's a marketer, but the two that are currently in marketing roles, um, because I saw your heads nodding fiercely uh, as Jackie was talking about the dime a dozen technology platforms. Because um, the two of you are the ones that are actively have, having to adjust those strategies. 
um, and turn to some of the partners potentially on, on this panel as well. Um, so I'm just curious as you've been working through adjusting your strategy, um, you know, what challenges are you overcoming? What resources are you finding that are helping you down that path? Um, and what, you know, tips and recommendations do you have for other marketers that are watching this and still struggling through that? So, um, Christina, you look like you've got something ready to go right now. So I'll let you go first. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think for us, it took a long time you know, we already had used GoToWebinar um, in a lot of the webinars that we were doing previously. So, you know, we started immediately to kind of transition our efforts um, to using that. And we're hoping to do some more like live events that are similar to what we've done at trade shows, but we haven't, we haven't necessarily gotten there yet. I think, I think we'll get there closer to June and July. Um, but I think what I kind of learned immediately is that, you know, a lot of people have grace right now, right? Like they're not expecting like when you join um, you know, a Zoom meeting or go to webinar link that you, it's going to be the, you know, greatest AV technology, right? Like everyone expects you to be in your home and, you know, like, so, so I think I realized early on that not to put too much pressure on, you know, speakers or other partners that we were working with that really like we can tee these up pretty quickly as long as we have really good, you know, marketing to, to back that up. But from a, at least in my opinion, from an AV standpoint, I think, I think there's a lot of ability in there that that doesn't, you know, obviously want to have you be able to hear people and, you know, the audio and everything to work there. But I, I wouldn't stress too much on the tools itself just to make sure you have something that's that's functional for you. Yeah, I love the comment, um, Grace. We've been saying that a lot with with our clients on the automation side of things, too, because yeah. they've all been panicking and like <laughs> and even clients that are coming and looking to pivot. i um, saying we've never done this. We don't know what to do. And it's like, well, now's the time to do it because. Yeah. You can make your mistakes now. Um, a lot of people, like you said, uh, have grace uh, for those mistakes. Jenna, do you want to add to it? Yeah, definitely. I last year I, I focused so much of my efforts on trying to do live streaming for our executive committee, okay. and just trying to get them on the screen. We're doing these long, drawn out email communications, newsletters that nobody reads, <laughs> and so I've been trying to get them to be more comfortable on a camera do live streaming, be on these webinars, and they've, we've gotten so much pushback, but now because of this, it's, they're getting more comfortable with it. They're entertaining the idea. They're doing weekly calls with our, our corporate office. They're um, adjusting and adapting to it. So I think in a way this has worked in my benefit because it's another way of pushing the agenda of being visible and being in front of your company, especially as it starts to grow um, and making sure that that communication, that uh, message is is coming from the top and is coming coming across in a personal um, personal manner where they can see your emotion, they can see your um, your mannerisms, they get to get that personal sense of you. Um, so I think that is what a lot of audiences are looking for is just the personality in it and um, having it be a personalized message, especially from a distance. And as we have these these walls up and um, as we're working in closed offices and closed spaces and we don't get to actually see the person in person. So I think um, adding that more, uh, that message and that realness to your, what you're trying to convey is important. Um, so yeah, and I, I, to Christina's point too, nobody's expecting to be perfect. And it's, sometimes it's actually hilarious if, if there's a little uh, snafu and something goes wrong, you know, it, it makes us real and it makes us genuine and nobody's perfect. And um, it just adds that personal touch to the communication. And, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's been um, an interesting part to learn through all of this is we're all learning. We're all, it's all, it's new for all of us. So. I think that's an interesting comment that you made at the beginning there about uh, the resistance from leadership or the resistance from your team to potentially embrace the virtual elements of it. Um, I'm wondering if the event companies on the call here are, if that's a barrier that you're having to overcome with, with, the, with your clients that maybe it's almost like you're put into like a media training role all of a sudden of like, this is how you interact on a camera. This is how you like project your voice. This is like, it, it's, it's, I feel like maybe the change of conversation around what an event is and what your roles and expectations are um, is different because of it being this way. Um, I guess that's more of just an open question for the rest of you. Um, 
I'm seeing some nodding heads. So um, Jackie, do you want to chime in? Yeah, absolutely. Jenna, I definitely appreciate that comment because I think that totally hits the nail on the head. I mean, virtual events have been around for a long time, but again, they haven't really been like a thing for the last, you know, for a while. So the last couple of months, I think it, for us working with our clients, after we got over that initial shock, it was, it was really showing the executive teams and, you know, our main client contacts that, you know, we do need to pivot virtually because we know that a lot of these events, they drive stock sales, they really drive the ROI of companies. So it took a lot of, of demos of really giving those um, suggestions of how we can utilize a virtual event. And I think the, the biggest challenge we've had, um, you know, and again, I'm sure the other event people on this call definitely agree is that um, really getting the client to understand what makes, it, what makes a, successful, a, a successful virtual event is not necessarily what a user conference is, right? It all, it's all about content. Content is king, that's what people come back to events for, to network, to meet with sponsors, to make sure that they get that face-to-face. -face. But the way that you do that in a virtual event is very different. And I think it's, it's been a learning curve with getting executives to understand, you know, you can have a virtual exhibit hall, but it's not necessarily just tiles that you click on. It's how do you use a networking algorithm to get people you know, to have suggested content or face-to-face -face interactions that are more on a screen versus, you know, face-to-face -face with chatting. So um, it was really the challenge was getting people to understand the value of virtual events and why they are so important. Um, and again, it's, you know, kind of with, with what those different challenges are, it's also to what Jenna said, making sure that people lean into the times. Again, I mean, you see the background of the home that I'm in. Um, Again, with executives, they want it to be perfect, which we definitely understand. We want that high production value, but it's, you know, it's, it's very human to, you know, stumble on your words or have your cat in the background. I mean, I feel like that really brings back to what Rich said about those authentic experiences. I mean, we're all in this together. We get it and we just have to lean, really lean into the situation that we're in. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for the addition there. Um, I want to pick up on one point that you brought up. Um, about getting buy-in on how you measure virtual events differently. Um, Cause that was another area where I saw kind of everybody's head start nodding in agreement is this is probably something either the rest of the event uh, production folks are dealing with with clients or that Christina and Jenna are dealing with internally. Um, so I'd actually love to just kind of have all of you sound off on some of the different perspectives um, of how you're dealing with those questions um, and how you're pivoting that. Um, so let's start with you, Steph. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we when we first came about all of this too, we wanted to try to help our clients we wanted to provide as much of a real experience as possible. Um, and so with that, you there are a lot of things that you you can carry over from what you would do at a live event to a virtual event. You know, you there are in terms of engagement or attendee, or you know, those are all things that you can measure on a on virtual platforms. So I think that those those definitely stay. Um, but I, I I feel like there's yeah. I, I will leave it at that for now, if anyone else wants to, to join in on for, I'd be curious to know what, what other people are doing in terms of ROI. It is a little different on the tech side than what you might see on the planning side. Um, but I would say really for what we do, it all carries over from what we would do in a live event. Cool. Um, Jenna or Christina, do you wanna sound off on the marketing side? Oh, people <laughs> at the same time. I can go. Um, yeah, I think I think we're internally still trying to figure out, you know, what that looks like. I think we typically we've done trade shows and events in the past. It was definitely for a, a new a new business perspective. Not as I mean, obviously we talk to current customers there as well. But a lot of the um, you know webinar and event strategy that we pivoted pivoted to now is really helping our customers. You know, we found that a lot of what we're doing is really just thought leadership, right? They they want to be heard. They want to you know, meet in a round table setting and hear, you know, people discuss like what tactics they're doing, similar to like what we're doing here today. Um, so for us, I feel like the ROI, we're still figuring that out, right? But I, I think for us, it's just getting, you know, making sure right now that we're actually getting attendees, you know, we're getting a lot of registrations. Um, that, that, that was all something new to us. Um, and, and then we can kind of pivot from there to figure out, you know, how do we, 
you know, get customers from this? How do we get more people to generate revenue on our platform? Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's still like taking a little time. Um, we just have to get that base first. Hmm. Yeah, and I would say in our area, it's a little bit different. So our clients or our customers are still in our company. There are developers. And so we service them by hosting an event for their property. So they, they break ground at this property in this state um, or they do a grand opening. And so how we service them, it's or how we get the, the ROI for them, we actually don't know about it because what it is, it's the network and the connections that they get to make at these events. And we typically don't hear about that down the road. So there's, there's been times where I hosted an event and only 15 people showed up and I'm like, this is a bust. Like usually we have 50 people. So the fact that only 15 showed up was sad to me. And then um, at the end of the event, before we, we got back on the plane to head back to Minnesota, the our SVP of property management was like this was a huge success you don't understand the importance of having these people and making these connections they weren't going to allow any buildings to be built or any properties to be built in this area until they came to this event they spoke with our developers and now they're on board and so I think the the developers our clients see the ROI on it but we don't necessarily as the event planners sure Rich, I see your mute. Yeah, I'm just working my working my own technical challenges here. Okay. So somebody said grace with uh, technical uh, needs. No yeah, I think it really this is going to uh, really challenge. I think marketers and companies on the definition of ROI, um, cost for return um, of activity, um, and I think it also is going to challenge all of us to say what really is the problem we're trying to solve for. Uh, we're all dealing with Zoom fatigue at some point. Um, you can only do so many roundtables yeah. and so many um, connection points. Right? That's the challenge of losing lot large events where people are dedicated to going to an area to learn, uh, gain information, uh, buy new products. Um, I think we're, we're creating fatigue. Um, and there's, I don't know, there might be a new ROI metric about fatigue um on how do you connect but when we do connect virtually um what's the follow-up right how are we closing that loop um that's what you know i'm thinking about what our clients is it's great to do it but what's the next step yeah. right how are we going to close that loop to demonstrate the roi because i think senior leaders and businesses may challenge um organizations going forward around expense for traditional large events right? Nobody's traveling. Yeah. Uh, we don't have the expense of events. Um, so I think it's going to force all of us to really have a tighter point of view on ROI and bringing that more into our solutions and uh, being accountable to it, right? If we're going to ask clients to spend money with us, uh, let's stand behind and, and put our name to the results that we can help them drive. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, that's a perfect segue into what was going to be my last question, but I'm going to do it right now because I think it's a really poignant, poignant time to ask that question. Um, for each of you in your individual roles um, at your organizations, um, you know, what, what do you kind of see as the lasting impact? So obviously at some point somewhere in the future, this, the threat of COVID-19 will be diminished, whether it's completely gone or not, that we, we don't really know what, what that is, but at some point um, we'll get back to some sort of normal. So my question is, what do you see as the lasting impact of the time that we're in right now on thinking around events on sales and marketing, um, which you see why it was a perfect <laughs> segue out of Rich's comment about challenging ROI. Uh, if I, I'll just continue, if you don't mind, I, I think the lasting impact is going to force all of us to think about innovation. Uh, the things that we haven't discovered yet, um, I think is really going to be uh, the lasting uh, impact item. Um, I think the way we do things today may, may, not, may not be sustainable. Uh, so there is a whole new element of engagement um, using technology. Um, even more advanced. I think at some point we're not going to get forgiveness for our glitches um, and the, the stakes are going to be raised uh, because it is going to be about that engagement point. How do we connect 
people. And ultimately, how do we convert those people um, back to the ROI? So um, I'm going to challenge all of us to think about innovation. Yeah, I think that's great. Christina, do you want to add anything? No, I mean, I, def I was agreeing with him for sure. I think for me, I struggle with figuring out what, what the next, what it's going to look like. Like I try to envision, it, will we have trade shows and what would those look like when we do? Um, so I think he hit the nail on the head. I think it's for me, it's really figuring out like, how can you innovate during this time and how can you be forward thinking? And, you know, we're challenging our customers too, is, you know, like if it might not go back to the way it was, right. So you always have to be thinking about what you can do differently and how you can pivot quickly. So I don't know that the answer is there yet, but I definitely agree. We're going to have to just, you know, ride the wave and, and figure out, you know, what that looks like. A heck of a wave. Yeah. <laughs> Jenna, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I piggyback off of all of that. I, I think it just, it, it forces us to really think about our message and what's our purpose rather than, oh, just standard, we host the event. Why are we hosting the event? What are we trying to get out of the event? Um, what's the reason for this? What's the main message? Can this be done in other ways? Does it have to be an event? Could it be um, just a quick, you know, 30 second video? Or is it a um, a one-on-one -on -one meeting? Is it um, still an in-person event, but it's a more an intimate event? Is it, you know, it's just looking at different ways and then, yeah, just seeing where technology is going to take us and seeing uh, the different opportunities and um, the innovation that comes out of where, you know, what technology is going to grow. And I think what we have on our side is People were forced to adapt to this. And now I Brian's <laughs> back in. Speaking there of this. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Ryan, you are the perfect example of, of what we are discussing and how you know, I, we, I really we, admire you for 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 playing the role of letting us see how glitches work. You didn't we have to and this actually, this was part of it. So yeah, we thanks. planned the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot. Well, Good I don't job. even know where I dropped off. I I think Jenna was talking and I didn't hear the end of it, so now I'm gonna have to try to like fake a segue out of that. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so we were talking about the lasting <laughs> impact. Um, Jenna, did you get to complete what you were saying and hopefully the rest of everybody else heard it before I lost it? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> I, I think the, the it, people are gonna be more willing to adapt and go with the flow, try new things. Um, I think this has forced us to adapt. And so I think they're just going to be more open to new ideas and new initiatives and um, see where technology is going to take us. So, yep. For sure. All right. I still Stephanie. think even through it, we got to be able to adapt to how people want to engage. Uh, for everybody that wants this environment, there is going to be audiences that want to be in community. Yeah. Um, so how do we accommodate both right it's it, it's it's again meeting people where they're at um and creating multiple communities so brands can be successful yeah living in both the virtual and in-person environment definitely send out surveys ask them ask what they want ask their preferred method of communication what do they want to see what do they want how do they want to be communicated with absolutely uh, Stephanie or Jackie, do you want to add a thought to to the future here? Sure. Yeah. I Jenna, I think that was um, kind of a perfect segue to something I wanted to mention. I mean, I think I think you know it's it's obviously, in my opinion, going to be a while before we have massive conferences and events. And I think even when that starts to happen, that attendee anxiety is still going to be there. So I think what we're doing with a lot of our clients is. You know, we really have to use, I said earlier, the gray area that I know me personally as event planner makes me cringe, but we have to kind of capitalize on this gray area and continue to be creative and understand, you know, as we do events going forward, you know, they're likely going to have to be virtual still, in my opinion, for a while. But then once we start to have, 
you know, allowing people to be at events and once, you know, eventually social distancing might kind of teeter off. How do we continue to still have that hybrid model? You know, I feel like in the past set events, you know, when we weren't really thinking virtual, it was, oh, there, there's a live stream over there. Okay, great. But there, there's people at the end of the live stream. So now we have to think with every event, once we do go back to kind of that in-person model, how do we continue to have that hybrid model? Because we, you know, we've created this audience over the past couple of months and we'll continue to that people are craving content from home. But how do we make sure that we don't forget about those people and make sure that they feel included in events and they, they feel like they have a place to be that they physically cannot be there. So I think it's important that we can continue you kind of have to start building that into all of our events and making sure that we can have that angle to offer that experience to people. Jackie, that's exactly, we are on the same wavelength. Uh, I think from a hybrid perspective, yeah, I think that's going to be, you'll see that for a long time after this, um, having the virtual component on top of the in-person meetings or events. Um, and I think the people that will go to the events, I, I feel like in-person events are going to be valued a lot more. You know, I think those who might be experiencing some of that anxiety can opt to stay home, but those that are going to be there in person, I, I just feel like people, I, we've only been up for like a couple months and people are so antsy for that human connection again. And I really think that that's something that will not be taken for granted when we start to get back to normal. And as we talked about the importance of content as king, I think it's gonna raise the expectation on content uh, at live events and shows and exhibits. Um, so if somebody is going to uh, make the effort to go, I think it's gonna create an expectation. Um, that's certainly where the whole element of experience design uh, comes in. Um, how do we engage all of their senses um, and really make it a place where they want to be and demonstrate that, you know, it, it, this is good, <laughs> right? We can't mm -hmm. stay locked up um, behind Zoom meetings uh, that, you know, but again, people have to be able to integrate with empathy. Um, but I think it raises the expectation on uh, the content that we create and the experiences that we design uh, to really engage people. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that, Rich. I mean, I think a lot of the events that we're working on, you know, traditionally have been, you know, a higher you know, amount of money to go to. And now because it's virtual, we're pivoting to them being free events. And again, content is king, but eventually we're going to go back to that model of people paying to be there. So to what Rich said, how do we ensure, you know, if I'm going to an event that, you know, the content there is worthwhile. I was getting it, you know, free and consumable on demand and complimentary before. Now that I'm going back, again, we really have to raise the bar with our clients to make sure that the content there is thoughtful and it's worth them being there. Awesome. So I'm going to um, open it up to the group here. We kind of started to have some exchange uh, between each other um, to let you ask some questions of each other um, or, or our team, um, because I think the brain trust we have here is a is a good thing. Um, so I have one more question that I'll ask before the end of this. But if any of you have a question you want to ask to the group, um, raise your hand so that we don't all start talking at the same time. And then I'll I'll call on you, and you can unmute yourself. All right, Rich. I'll go, sorry. Uh, what's been your collective experiences with clients? Um, initially, when this all hit, uh, and how are you finding those conversations evolving and changing? I can speak right. to that a little bit. Um, I mean, certainly from our perspective, I mean, I feel like we've grown even closer to our clients. I think that we've been able to have some really real honest conversations. And I mean, certainly we're always very transparent with our clients about, you know, the pros and the cons of everything. But I think it's been a really exciting growth opportunity with our clients to just continue to instill ourselves, you know, as a third party agency, sometimes, you know, 
um, with budget cuts, of course, events are some of the first things or people that are looked at. But, you know, in this time, we've been able to really connect on a deeper level with our clients, um, really leverage, you know, our strategy and our advising to them because they, we definitely have their ear right now. So we've really been able to grow even closer during this time. Anyone else? Okay. So my last question for the group, and I want to thank you all so much for your time. This has been really insightful. Um, and I really hope the recording didn't get ruined when I lost you all. If not, that's why we have three other people on here taking copious notes. Um, so my question for you all uh, is uh, share a win that you've had. Um, I want to end on some good news since um, I had to pivot and use up my what was going to be my last question because Rich teed me up and I couldn't hit it because I couldn't miss that because it was a perfect at bat. Um, so share a win, share something that has been a success for you um, in your pivot during this crazy time. Um, and maybe it's something that somebody else can learn from that's listening to this. Um, uh, I'll just start on the right hand of my screen and work the, my way over and you have no idea who I'm going to be calling on. So that's going to be super fun. All right. Uh, so Christina, you're up first. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it kind of goes off of what uh, but for a style or try one in a style or we can do a live event that's a tra live trade show booth where they could talk with sales um so for me i think it's it's been a win just to be able to try different things um i think historically at field nation people probably had ideas of what worked and what didn't work but this is a great time for us to figure that out um so for me it's just been fun to be able to think of maybe this is a wild idea but let's see let's survey the audience let's see if they're interested and if they're not um, we know that doesn't work right and, and no one's upset that we didn't get a ton of people to attend it um so i think just really for us having that flexibility has been a win for me is we never had that really as much um in the past awesome thanks christina jackie yeah thank you i would definitely agree with what christina said um you know i think you know when when you when we've had clients for a long time you know we we know how the event works right we know what their schedules are um, things of technology or partners you know that we've been wanting to integrate with the client for years but the need wasn't really there before right so I think it's and it's been really exciting to have you know even though again it is a great area to have the opportunity like Christina mentioned to be creative and really push technology to the limits again you know there's always spend on AV and things like that but live streaming it's so important using networking algorithms like those are the things that I, as an event planner in Taipei, we love to do and work with, but necessarily the, the need wasn't always there with our clients. But now that it is, it's been exciting to kind of get that to their forefront and invest in that. And then now that we kind of have them excited about that, knowing that we could potentially continue to leverage that in the future. Awesome. Steph? I think there might be a common theme. Um, creativity, creativity and innovation has been a really fun part of weirdly enough in all of this um, not as a team um, that we've been able to do together it's been really, really cool to see you know each of our team members bringing certain things to the table and coming up with ideas and solutions that if you know this hadn't happened we might not be having that conversation um, so yeah that's been a it's been a really big win for us and has brought it brought us closer together as a team and has brought us closer to our clients and, and new companies and clients. So that's a big win for us. Awesome. Jenna. Yeah, I would piggyback off of all of that. Um, just the fl flexibility of everything and how um, agile everyone is being right now. Uh, one of our biggest wins would, I would be, I would say would be um, that we are more inclusive now. So we would always hear, you know, we have the silo at the corporate office versus site. And so what we did about three weeks ago was we hosted a company-wide trivia 
um, trivia contest. And so in the past, we would just stick to our normal routine. We would have that at the corporate office. Sites wouldn't be included, but this allowed us to include all of our sites. So over a thousand employees got to participate in this trivia contest. It made us feel more as one um, and that we got to engage and have fun together. Um, so I thought that was a huge win for us and our company. In addition to that, just being able to invite anyone, no matter where they're located, um, they don't need to travel, they don't, they don't need to take that time out of their day to commute or travel to an event. Instead, they can all join us and, and um, participate in a single event and, and get to see one another. We actually have our cameras. And so you can see people's faces, you can hear their voice, you can have conversations with them. You don't miss on the, on the entire event just because you can't travel there. Awesome. Rich? I think I'd first start with <clears throat> going through all these challenges. It's been pretty remarkable to see an organization rally around um, all of this, right? Um, somebody made the comment um, about fear. Um, our whole perspective is around hope and optimism, right? So as we're pivoting, uh, it's been pretty incredible to see an organization through all the challenges just work extremely hard uh, to come up with new solutions. You know, and then, you know, from a physical win, since we are in the physical environment design, um, how do we challenge our collective go-to-market? And where do we show up in the area that you would never imagine start of the recovery? Um, create new communities um, and allow ourselves, um, you know, to see some success uh, even through all the challenges that uh, we're collectively dealing with. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Rich from Star, Jenna from Dominium, Seth from Heroic, Jackie from Type A, and Christina from Field Nation. I am so, so grateful for all of your time. Um, and all of your insights and thought. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Bye, guys.